Good morning, friends. Uh, a warm welcome to this time of worship and a uh, special welcome to visiting friends who are with us today. There's tea and coffee served in the church hall, and please stay if you can. And there are evening services at 6 p.m., and again, all welcome. And our midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study. It's a joint prayer meeting, and it's here in the church. And all the other intimations as for the sheet. Thank you. Hand over now to Scott. Well, can I maybe just mention that, as many of you know, I was away this week at an in-service conference uh, for the United Free Church, where I got to meet many of the ministers. So don't ask me when I, when you're leaving today, did you enjoy your holiday? <laughs> now, now, there's a scripture verse that talks about when two or agree on anything touching this earth. Well, I have to say that all the ministers that I met were saying, now, oh, you're a Ballantour. Oh, well, the folks of Ballantour, they're lovely. So it must be true. So, but let's worship the Lord together. In Psalm 96, we read, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Well, we're going to worship the Lord in our opening psalm, Psalm 29, and verses 1 to 4, and then 7 to 9. Give ye unto the Lord, ye sons, that of the mighty be, or strength and glory to the Lord, with cheerfulness give ye. Let's worship together. Yeah. 
Well, let's unite our hearts as we pray together. Let's pray. Oh, our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you today as your children, grateful for the opportunity to gather in your presence. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and your unending love that meets us right where we are. And so as we worship together, oh, we ask that you would fill this place with your spirit, stir our hearts, renew our minds, and Lord, let your peace and joy flow through us. And as we confess our sins, Lord, we do often trip and stumble in our walk with you. We also fail to love you as we ought. And Lord, we often struggle to love others as we should. And so, Lord, forgive us. And thank you that in Christ we can know cleansing, that we can know the rivers of purity and holiness and justice, goodness and truth. And so, Lord, help us to walk in the freedom and grace you've given us. And now, Lord, we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts. Oh, draw us closer as we worship you this day. And Lord, we desire, oh, to know you more. So let us hear your voice. Oh, that we would feel your presence and that we would experience your power. And Lord, let your word come alive to us transforming us to be more like Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask that you would bless each heart here today. Lord, I know that many may carry their concerns and worries for loved ones, for their health. And so, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, I pray, Lord, would you place your everlasting arms around us, hold us, and may we know such a blessing that will pour from here and out to our communities and through the nations. And Lord, bring glory to your name we pray. And in Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Yes, exactly. Now, can I tell you, when our children were very young, I, 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 think, I, I think I got more excited actually at night time than they did because I got out these books that I loved from Dr. Zeus and I would get so caught up with all the animations and, and, the, and I would put on all the voices for them. One particular favourite was Green Eggs and Ham and I would read it to them and I think I was laughing more than they were but oh, we had fun with these books. And another book was called Horton hatches the egg. Have you ever read the book? Anyone seen the book before? No? Oh, well you have to get it now. <laughs> Horton the elephant. It's a, it's a wonderful story. There was a bird called Maisie. She was very, very lazy. And she would sit on it. She had an egg there in her nest and she sat there day in, day out waiting for the egg to hatch. But you know, poor Maisie, she got really lazy and she got tired and she got bored and she kept dreaming that she would go off to Florida. If only someone could look after the egg. Now this is what Maisie said. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest if I could find someone to stay on my nest, said Maisie. And of course, she found someone to look after her egg. Horton, can you see Horton there, the elephant? Well, Horton agreed, after a lot of arguing, that he would look after the egg and that he would sit in the egg and just take care of it. And so Maisie went flying away. And can you see her in the back there? She's flown away now, away to enjoy her holiday. Well, her days away became weeks and her weeks away became months. It came to winter time. 
and the snow would fall and poor Horton, the icicles would drip from his nose and his, and his toes. And eventually, poor Horton, people would come and say to Horton, and they would make, in fact, they would make fun of him, saying, why don't you just leave the egg? But this is what Horton said. I'd stay on this egg and I wouldn't let it freeze, he said with a sneeze. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful 100%. Well, I was always told that elephants never forget. Well, in this wee story, we're reminded of Horton, who, who was 100% faithful to the promise he had made with Maisie. And even when people would laugh at him, and even when winter came and the storms came and, oh, things went wrong. with, But Horton stayed faithful. And you know, there's a lovely wee chorus. We're not going to sing it today. But the chorus says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You know, when we receive Christ, when we receive Jesus into our hearts, the Bible tells us, when you receive Jesus, remember, be faithful. Be faithful 100% that you would go after Jesus with all your heart. You know, I went after Jesus when I was 20 years old. My re deepest regret is that I didn't go after him when I was much, much younger. And I'm sure some of the older folks here today would say the same. That, oh, they would have gone after Jesus when they were even younger. And so today, oh, that you would ask Jesus into your hearts and that you would be a faithful follower 100%. Oh, can you do that? Well, can we all just pray together? Let, let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for this time together where you invite us to trust you 100%. And that we would be faithful to follow you. To be faithful, Lord, to share the love of Jesus with others. To be faithful in the place of prayer. To be faithful in the house of God. And Lord, to be faithful in the word of God. But Lord, we can't do this in our own. And we ask that you would fill each heart here with your love, your joy, your strength. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit as we seek to follow Jesus, no turning back. And so, Lord, hear our prayers as we pray in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Well, I know the children are going out to Sunday school, and while they do that, we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
And I would like us now to turn to our Bible reading there from Exodus chapter 33 and from verse 7. Exodus chapter 33 and from verse 7 to 23. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Amen. And may the Lord bless us the reading of his inerrant and infallible word. Well, let's unite our hearts once again as we pray. Let's pray. Oh, our gracious and eternal God, we come to you this morning with hearts open, knowing you are such a loving God who hears the cries of your people. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and for the gift of just gathering us together as a church family. And Lord, I pray also for those who are maybe visiting today. I pray that they will feel so much part of the family here and that they would know your sweet presence (coughs) drawing them. And so, Lord, today we lift up those among us who are carrying heavy burdens. Lord, for those struggling emotionally, mentally or physically, oh, how we ask, Lord, for your peace, your (coughs) comfort, your healing. Lord, surround them with your presence and give them strength for each new day. And Lord, we especially pray for those waiting for maybe test results, particularly those facing the uncertainty of cancer or other sicknesses. Lord, be the rock in their storm. 
Fill them with your perfect peace that surpasses understanding. And Lord, today we lift up parents and families of those we love so dearly. And Lord, those especially who are walking through a dark valley, Lord, hold them close. Lord, let them know they're not alone. Fill them with courage, hope, and your deep, sustaining love. And Lord, for our church here, and for the church worldwide, we ask that, oh, that we would always live in your presence, seeking your pleasure and walking in the power of the Spirit. Lord, help us to be a community that reflects the very nature of God. Lord, that we would show love, grace and mercy that we would show the loveliness of Christ through the way we walk and talk, the way we act, the way we live. Oh Lord, may it reflect the loveliness of, and the sweetness of Christ. And Lord, we also bring before you this day, Lord, the brokenness of our world, Lord, torn apart by war and strife. Lord, would you heal the wounds of division? And Lord, again for that peace to places of conflict. And Lord, in these sad times, we continue to remember Israel, Gaza and the West Bank and all the other nations throughout the world. Lord, may the Prince of Peace come. And Lord, please fulfill your covenant promises. Hear our prayers, forgive our sins, and heal our land. And Lord, grant the peace of Jerusalem. And throughout Europe, the UK, Scotland, from the highlands and islands to the lowlands. And Lord, to our own community here, oh, that we would know your rich presence and power. Lord, would you cause your church to burn again with such love and, and compassion. Lord, a heart for the lost and a deep, deep love for Jesus. Lord, help us to leave here strengthened and empowered. And so, Lord, we ask for unity in the body of Christ. Lord, may your church be bound together in love and truth, burning with passion for Christ and the lost. And Lord, where the world would see the beauty of your kingdom. And so, gracious Lord, oh, how we trust in your goodness and in your power to heal, restore and renew. But Lord, we especially pray today, would you now refresh us? Oh, that we would know streams from the throne of grace. And Lord, hear our prayers, and especially the quiet prayers that we carry ourselves here today on behalf of loved ones, families, and our own communities. And so, Lord, bless, we pray, as we do offer these our prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> well, we're now going to sing together in Charles Wesley's beautiful hymn, Come Holy Ghost, Our Hearts Inspire. <coughs> Yeah. 
Well, can we now return to our reading there in Exodus chapter 33? Well, as we consider this morning, these verses, oh, they're dear, aren't they? I know as we read them, probably many of you were going back to a time where you've maybe heard a sermon before on this very text, where you see the heart of Moses crying out, Lord, show me your glory. Over these weeks, we're, we're considering a series, New Vision for a New Season. And we've been considering those, the lives of those who had such an encounter with God that it changed the direction of their lives. It changed everything. And so this morning, we're considering Moses here he is. He's not to enter the promised land. And yes, he had prayed that he would. There in Deuteronomy, chapter 3, you'll read there of Moses' prayer, or oh, that he would enter in with his people, just to be with the Lord's people and to see the glory of what's coming. But the Lord told Moses, Moses, you know, <laughs> you're not going to have that prayer answered. You're not to go in. And so Moses begins to prepare the people for what's coming. Well, God had, as we know the story, God had withdrawn his presence already because of the sins of the people. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? When God withdrew his presence from the people of God, what were they doing? Here they were, up there on the mountain, Moses told them, wait, wait. He was going up into the mountaintop to meet with God, to have an encounter with God that would change the nation. And so he told them, now wait, wait. But could they wait? They couldn't wait for the real thing. They couldn't wait upon the presence of God. Instead, they created their own worship. And what do we find them doing? We find them dancing and singing. And they, have, they gather up all their gold and they melt it down. And suddenly, as Aaron would say, this golden calf just happened to appear. So we knew this must be the God they were to worship. And you know, there they are. And you would think, wow, that looks like a good going church. They look so happy and the singing is vibrant. Everything looks amazing. The kind of church you would say, wow, yeah. That would be a great church to be part of. Where there's life and vigor and... Oh, and you can see them there just worshipping. But you know, they weren't worshipping God. They were worshipping a God that was actually created in their own image. They were worshipping a false idol. But they were so convinced that they were really worshipping God. So much so that they were even dancing with joy. They, they were worshipping something that was created. And so here, now, God withdraws his presence. And they're just left to it. And they're carrying on worshipping away. They're carrying on their church service. They're getting on with their worship there. God's not there, but they, can see, they, they seem to be able to keep going. And you know, the sad thing is that many today in Scotland and throughout the world, we can get into a rut where we get into a habit of just coming to church. We can get into a habit of Christianity, but know very little of the power of God. Now that's a reality. Paul talks of that in the New Testament. I don't know if you've ever read John Bunyan's book Pilgrim's Progress. It's one of my favourite books. I, in fact, I try to get into a habit of making sure I read it every year. And the worst of that book, though, is that I would often see myself in every character apart from Christian and you would read about pliable and obstinate and oh, all these remarkable characters. 
and pliable especially. Pliable was the one who at the beginning walked with Krishna and said, oh, I'll go. And Krishna would encourage him to read the Bible. And Pliable would say, no, it's all right. I'm happy just hearing you tell me about the, the city, the beautiful city, and he loved to hear all the lovely stories and the nice stories in the Bible. And so Pliable was just happy with that. As long as, oh, no, just keep you tell me all the nice stories and about heaven and the wonderful city. And so Pliable would walk with Krishna like that. And then we're told that they came to their first problem, the slough of despond. And they fell into this muddy ditch. And Krishna is struggling as Pliable is. But then Pliable manages to get out. And what does he do? He decides to go back to his home. And he tells Krishna that if this is what walking to the city, the celestial city is all about, I'm not going. And he gives up. You know, here's Pliable. He didn't want to read the Bible for himself. He didn't want to follow the Lord really. He loved the ideas and the lovely stories and the dreams and the visions of what was to come. He liked all that. And maybe that's what they were like there on that mountain top. They had their dreams and their ideas of who God is and they would be worshipping their own ideas. And as God removes his presence, we're told that also 3,000 were killed. Isn't it interesting that on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was outpoured, 3,000 were saved. How remarkable. The people had broken God's covenant. And now Moses comes and he pleads on behalf of the people. And as he prays to the Lord, the people then repent. God heard the prayer of Moses. And God promises, don't worry. I will go with you. My presence will come again. And so God's presence came. The pillar of cloud would come. Moses came to experience on behalf of the people, that intimate presence of God. Now it's interesting actually when Moses is pleading with God about God's presence to go with them. Isn't it interesting that Moses tells the Lord, Lord, it's your presence that makes the difference. That's, that's what separates. That's what makes the life of the church. That's what makes life in the church happen. Is your presence. It's not whether we're happy and dancing and feeling everything's going well and even praying and reading the Bible and all these things. Lord, what makes the difference is your presence. We can come to church and we can read our Bibles, we can pray. The minister can give sermons as long as he like. But what makes the difference is the presence, the very presence of God. That's what makes the difference. And Moses knew that. And he said, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, what's the point in us moving forward? Because your presence makes the difference. That's what separates us. And so Moses had his prayer answered in a wonderful way. But, to, but we're not going to focus on that. I want you to notice, now the presence of God has come. God's presence is now with the people. The cloud has been restored of that glory. And now I want you to notice, Moses wants something more. If I was there on that mountaintop with the Lord, and the Lord said to me, Scott, don't worry, my presence is going with you. Don't worry about the days ahead. The people will be looked after. My covenant promise. I'll keep my promise. And you'd almost think that Moses would be just, Lord, that's it, thank you. That's all I ask. But you know, Moses doesn't do that. Moses isn't content with just things carrying on as normal. 
Moses prays for something more, something quite extraordinary, something quite unusual. What does he pray for? He prays for more of God. Now, did you get that? He knows the presence of God. He knows the glory of that mountaintop. But he prays, Lord, I want more of you. Have you ever prayed like that? Have you ever known God's blessing? Where he comes to your quiet time or he comes on a Sunday morning or in one of our meetings and God's presence, it's so sweet, it's so tangible. You can feel God's presence in the atmosphere. And you leave saying, that was lovely to be there. It was lovely to be with the Lord's people and to encounter and to know, oh, did you feel him? And it's lovely to share that. But you know, if, it, if Moses was here this morning, he would leave here and he would say, Lord, I want more. I want more of you in my life. I want more of your presence. And this is what he prays. He's praying here for the personal presence of God. That manifest presence. Because I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Now God already knows Moses well. Like a friend, we're told. And here's Moses praying, Lord, that I may know you. I want to know your ways. I want to know your heart. I want to know more, Lord. I want more of you in my life this day. Moses knew that he was accepted. He knew that he was forgiven. He knew that he was redeemed. He knew that he was saved. He was going now to be with the Lord. Moses knew all that, but he wanted more. He prayed, Lord, I know you love me, but show me. Lord, I know I've been redeemed, but show me. Oh, that you would show me your love. Show me your ways. Lord, put it on display. As I've shared already, the Puritans of the 17th century, they used to always encourage one another and they would encourage preachers, when you preach, make sure you preach a felt Christ. A Christ that is real in experience. Not just a Jesus that you can know about, but a Jesus that you can know in experience, in, your, in a relationship, not just in a religion or a philosophy or an ideology. This is Moses. He knew that God so loved the world that he would give his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Now Moses knew that. But Moses is praying, but Lord, show me. Show me that you love this world. Have you ever prayed like that? Maybe you've got loved ones in your family and you're really worried for them. Maybe there's a parent, a brother, a sister, a child, a sibling, just a relative that you're so concerned about. And you know that God loves them and God cares and God has a heart for them. Maybe the Lord's asking you this morning, will you come into my presence and plead with me that I would show you my love, my grace, my mercy, my tenderness? I know there's maybe hearts here today and maybe you've been questioning, does the Lord really have a tender heart towards me? I know what I've done this week. I know I've sinned and I've messed up my life. Scott, is it true? Can, is God really that tender? Is he that long-suffering? Is he that patient? Is he that kind? Is he really that loving? I would encourage you this morning. 
Why don't you pray? Lord, I've heard what Scott said. I've heard what many a preacher has said. But Lord, will you show me? Show me your love. Show me your grace. Show me your glory this morning. That I would experience you more deeply. Moses prayed to know more of the presence of God in his life. And I hope that's your prayer. I hope that's the church's prayer. That when God blesses that we would be crying out, Lord, more, more, more. Moses also goes on to pray to know the purposes of God. Not just the presence of God, but that he would know God's purpose. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us, that you will look upon us with mercy. But Lord, oh, that we could just know your heart and your ways. Lord, show me your plans. Show me your purposes. The Lord had promised that my presence will go with you. But Moses, I'll also give you rest. I will take away your distress. I will take away your anxiety. I will take away all that's causing you to not know that peace with me. And here's Moses. Lord, show me your way. Lord, show me your plans. So that I may be encouraged. And that I would know that your people will be blessed. And encouraged and oh, that they would go after you. What a prayer. You know, we often pray, Lord, as I'm going to do this, will you bless me? <laughs> Lord, I've thought of going here and I've thought of doing this and I've thought of doing that today. Lord, will you come now and bless me and bless what I'm intending doing? You know, Moses, it wasn't, Lord, come and bless me what I'm about to do. It was, Lord, show me what you're about to do and that I'll follow you. Is that your prayer? Lord, show me your way. Show me your plans. Show me your purpose. Show me your will for my life so that I will follow you, that I'm not going to be praying, Lord, come and look what I'm going to do. Will you bless this? Will you bless that? No, Moses, what a prayer. Do you know, today I believe we can learn so much from Moses in the place of prayer. How he prays for more of the presence of God in his life. He prays to know God's purposes, his plans, his heart. And now notice as Moses closes his prayer, he prays for the power of God. I think that's a, a brave prayer. Here's Moses. Why would he pray to know the power of God? Because Moses was aware of the magnitude of the problem that the people of God would face. Moses knew that the wilderness, there's going to be great, there's going to be giants in the land. There's going to be giant problems. They're going to face storms and trials. And what they need most is to know the power of God. Oh, Moses knew the strength of the enemy that they would face in that land. I wonder today, are you facing a giant problem? Are you facing a giant worry, a concern? And it may be not for yourself, it may be for another. You know, often we do, don't we? We, we carry the burdens of others. Our family, our loved ones. We hate seeing our loved ones suffering through sickness or going through storms and trials that come. Oh, we often get, we worry more often than our families do when they go through these problems. And here's Moses. He knew the problems that were coming. And the Lord knew the problems that they would face. And what they needed, what the need of the hour, was to know the power of God. When you look today throughout the, U Uni the United Kingdom, boy, what a mess. <laughs> We're seeing a spiritually dark time, 
upon these nations, upon England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales and throughout. I was sharing with some of the ministers down there in Grangemouth when I was away at the conference. I was interviewed and they were asking me about how do you feel about the spiritual climate of Scotland today? And I was saying to them, well, statistically, the church is declining. We're not seeing our young ones coming out to church. We're seeing churches emptying and closing. And spiritually, there's something that's come across our generation that I've already spoken to some of you, and you feel it too. It's like Egypt. You know where a plague of darkness came upon Egypt? And we're told that it was a darkness that may even be felt. It was like a spiritual darkness just came over the land where people could feel it. I've met many Christians who tell me, Scott, you know, I find it so hard to witness for Christ because now you're, 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 you're concerned about being call, you know, called out for a hate crime. And, and they're worried, sick about what's right, what, what are they able to say with all that's happening. And it's like a darkness that's come over our land that can even be felt. But others, there's other churches that are just happy just to carry on with the, with the flow. You know, the greatest need of the hour is all oh, that we would know the power of God. That's what we need. That's what the church needs. Did you know my father's church is on time. My father's church, not even the gates of hell will prevail. Don't worry about the church. <laughs> Don't worry. God is sovereign. He reigns and everything is on time. God's plans, not the devil cannot thwart a single purpose and plan of God. He's got no hope. Everything is actually going according to plan. Jesus is coming back quickly and he'll come soon. And he's coming for his bride. He's coming for his church. He's coming for all who have put their trust in their saviour. Nothing will ever change that plan. God, show me your plans. He's coming. He's coming. But what we need today is the power of God manifest again that we would know another day I'm sure you've all read the stories already of Duncan Campbell preaching in this very church when he was the first minister here and revivals there in the 1920s here in these seaboard villages where God moved in power I hope it's your prayer Lord move again move again And I was with you in weakness, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Today, O oh Lord, that we would know your presence with us, that we would know your purpose, that we would be reminded again of your plans. And Lord, oh, that we would know your power. Lord, restore to us. Oh, renew us, revive us. Is that your heart? The reason we pray like this and the reason Moses prayed like that was because he wanted to live for the pleasure of God. He wanted to live to please God. That's why he needed the presence and to know God's purpose and to know his power so that he could live to please God, to glorify him. And today, that's what we need. Oh, to get a vision of God's glory. Well, let's unite our hearts as we pray together. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for your presence here with us. But Lord, like Moses of old, and like the Apostle Paul and all the other saints we read of, Lord, our desire also is to know more, 
to know more of your love, to know more of your grace, to know more of your mercy. Lord, to know more of your presence. And Lord, to know your ways, to know your will, to know your purpose. And Lord, oh, that we would know your power. Lord, may your Holy Spirit just rest upon us, empowering us to live for your glory, that we would please you. Oh, that we would be single in living for your glory. And Lord, I thank you for every heart in this place. Lord, oh, that you would bless them. And hear their, their own hearts cry and their prayers. As we do pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's sing together in our closing hymn. This is another beautiful hymn. William Williams, the great Welshman and hymn writer, he penned these beautiful words. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. So let's worship together. Let us go in the strength of the Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all and remain with us now and always. Amen.